Good morning. Two weeks ago, I began to tell you two stories. One story is of Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward, a spirituality for the two halves of life. Rohr is a Franciscan brother in the Catholic Church, a well-known writer and speaker on spiritual growth, solace, and learning. The other story is my own, the hesitant and still unfinished story of recent changes in my own soul, which seem to echo and affirm Rohr's ideas about spirituality in, as he puts it, the second half of life. Rohr posits that there are two halves to human spiritual life. The first half consists of building the container that will hold us safe for most of our lives, acquiring identity, information, relationships, power, security. The first half of life is all about survival. The task of the second half of life is to find the contents the container was meant to hold. Rohr writes, we are a first half of life culture, largely concerned about surviving successfully. Probably most cultures and individuals across history have been situated in the first half of their own development up to now because it is all they had time for. As dwellers in the so-called first world, we receive constant urgent messages telling us, screaming at us, that the quest for successful survival never ends. In a cultural system that's entirely founded on endless, structurally necessary consuming, we will never once go through a day without an advertisement, a family member, a friend, a colleague, a stranger in a grocery store, a book, a movie, a television show, telling us that there is one more thing we must have, one more thing we must do, and one more thing we must buy to get ahead, to be safe, to be secure, to survive, to win. Over all this noise, it can be almost impossible to hear and heed the call to something more, something further, some way of life that does not demand losing and winning. Nevertheless, as we get older in years or experience, many, if not most of us who are not in direct survival mode, begin to wonder if there's more or what we're missing. Questions of how we are doing the things we're doing come to be as important as what we are doing in many ways. Roar again. It is when we begin to pay attention and seek integrity precisely in the task within the task that we begin to move from the first to the second half of our own lives. It is hard work. Most often we don't pay attention to that inner task until we've had some kind of fall or failure in our outer tasks. None of us go into our spiritual maturity completely of our own accord or by a totally free choice. Most of us have to be cajoled or seduced into it, or we fall into it by some kind of transgression. Setting out, he writes, is always a leap of faith, a risk in the deepest sense of the term, and yet an adventure too. The familiar and the habitual are so falsely reassuring, and most of us try to make our homes there permanently. The new is always by definition unfamiliar and untested, so God, life, destiny, suffering, have to give us a push, usually a big one, or we will not go. Now, before I go on, I want to quickly reintroduce Paul Ricoeur and his idea of a three-part life journey. It begins with the first naivete, where we accept as true whatever our parents and authorities tell us. God is good all the time, and Santa brings presents to all the happy children at Christmas. When these truths collide with the reality of a world where we're faced with senseless death or an upheaval, or where we see evil rewarded, well, we humans often enter the wilderness, the second stage of life. Finally, however, Ricoeur posits that through humility, experience, and intentionality, we may be called again. This, he wrote, can lead to the discovery of a second naivete, which is a return to the joy of our first naivete, holding it now as new, inclusive, and mature thinking. In my first sermon with you, I spoke about my own wilderness experience. 
Slow motion external catastrophes such as grief over climate change, our disastrous cultural response to COVID, gun violence, the erosion of civil rights and democratic processes. And then there have been the slow motion internal catastrophes. As I lost my father, my mother, my job at my beloved home church all within two years. Don't get me wrong. My life is not all woe and there have been joys and compensations along the way. Those of you who know me also know I'm generally more focused on the good in my life than the bad. And that's as it should be. And yet, and yet with all my privileges and all my blessings, there's also been pain. And so the wilderness. I suspect, and in fact, I know that many of you have been through your own personal hells in these years as well. I haven't made this journey alone. Which brings me nicely around to, well, you guessed it, necessary suffering. Last week, you heard Rohr make the statement, all suffering is undeserved. There's no other kind. That's what makes it suffering. What you didn't hear him say and what you won't hear him say is that suffering is unnecessary. In fact, without suffering, he writes, there is no practical or compelling reason to leave one's present comfort zone in life. Frankly, none of us do unless and until we have to. Any attempt to engineer your own enlightenment is doomed to failure because we will only see what we have already decided to look for and we cannot see what we're not ready or told to look for. Failure and humiliation force us to look where we never would otherwise. So we must stumble and fall, I am sorry to say. We must actually be out of the driver's seat for a while, or we will never learn how to give up control. This kind of falling is what I mean by necessary suffering. In much of urban and Western civilization today, with no proper tragic sense of life, we try to believe that it's all upward and onward and by ourselves. It works for so few and it cannot serve us well in the long term because it is not true. Psychiatrist Carl Jung believed that much neurotic behavior or suffering, we might say, is the result of refusing to confront, accept, and learn from the legitimate suffering so inherent to human and indeed all biological life. It seems to be only humans, however, who create excess pain by seeking to avoid necessary pain that is unavoidable. Rohr writes, reality, creation, nature itself has no choice in the matter of necessary suffering. Our refusal to accept and bear the pain of living alongside its pleasures seems to me yet another way we have cut ourselves off from the harmony of natural creation and what we need to learn from the natural world cycles of life and death. It's another way our preoccupation with the ego, which seeks to control nature just as it seeks to control everything, causes us to miss the mark which is, of course, the literal translation of the Hebrew word for sin. What Rohr is saying, and what many others have said in their time, is that it's only when we have borne the pain, truly borne it, after every attempt to escape with blaming and avoiding, distracting and fleeing, that we can truly learn something new from it. Think of the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. It's a four bullet point list of the sufferings we experience struggling against the reality of loss until we reach acceptance. Psychologist David Kessler, who worked with Diane Kubler-Ross as she was developing the five-stage grief model, adds a sixth stage to grief, meaning-making. This is where he and Rohr converge for me, with Rohr both agreeing and expanding the idea. Not only is meaning making a necessary step in processing grief and life and suffering, Rohr says, but you must experience the grief to get to the deeper meaning. Experiencing pain fully is a necessary step in the learning process that can lead to the maturation, to the blossoming or deepening, to the ripening and the thriving of our souls. 
until reality with a big fat capital R shows us incontrovertibly and sometimes even violently that we are not in control, that we don't have the answers, that we are frail and culpable and not only breakable, but broken. Until we are shown that, we cannot understand the great freedom that lies outside and beyond ourselves. We have to begin to let go of everything we were certain of, and it is agonizing work. As Rohr says, the human ego prefers anything, just about anything, to falling or changing or dying. In the age of anxiety, a novella-length poem by W.H. Auden, one war-broken speaker observes with detachment, we would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the present moment and let our illusions die. Our egos, so necessary to survival, differentiation, to the acquiring and gathering and building of the first half of life, must die, sometimes by killing, before we can see that there might be a different way. Until we've released what Rohr calls our personal salvation project, the secret myth that tells us we can and will save ourselves and or the world, we are bound to that, often enslaved to it in ways that blind us to other paths and possibilities. My personal salvation project, I realized as I wrote this sermon, was my embedded myth of human progress and perfectibility, which I labeled humanism. And I think that's a common salvific among liberal religious people, theistic or not. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I will say it's no longer right enough for me. My own version has been revealed as a faceless golden idol broken and half buried in the dug up grave dirt of my heart. But that image came to me after the first change, the first call, the first waking up. After my long time in the wilderness, something recently, call it three months ago, shifted. Right here at community in an adult RE class, we watched a brief video and were given the story of Bill Sinkford, who in a moment of fundamental crisis while praying for the life of his son, felt his own spiritual life shift. As he held his son's hands, he prayed prayers of regret and anguish, prayers of bargaining and denial. But eventually all his prayers coalesced and came together and just became one prayer just let my child be okay. And in that moment of releasing control, of giving over his earlier prayers of self-blame, sadness, anger, and regret, something changed. Bill felt, he said, held and comforted, heard and given solace by a loving God, a loving universe. He was a convinced longtime Unitarian Universalist atheist, agnostic, humanist, content and happy, but it all changed then. And that understanding of being loved and held by the universe led him to seminary, to Unitarian Universalist ministry, and eventually to be the first African-American president of our association. It's a good story. And after we heard it in class, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I hadn't been waiting for that story. I uh, hadn't expected to hear it and have such a powerful response to it. But every time I thought about it, and like I said, I couldn't stop thinking about it, I felt this sharp longing, this insistent goad that was saying, yes, this, until by myself one day I burst into tears and I realized, and I said out loud, I want that. I want that. Only it wasn't want, it was need. And the next thought that came to me was, can I have that? Why not? A little later, a couple of days later, I was on the phone with someone who had called for a bit of support 
And I ended the call by saying recklessly, and it felt reckless, but also like champagne. I've recently decided, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that the universe loves us. And so I'm telling you, it's not just me who loves you, but the whole universe. And we both laughed a little and left it at that. When I hung up, I felt like I'd gotten away with something, something good. I continued to play with the idea, even though there was a part of me down here in my belly and my heart that knew I wasn't playing at all. The belief had already shifted. I had decided, although that isn't quite the right word, to believe the universe loves us back. I have decided that, really. I woke up one morning and I felt different. I felt as though my internal geography had changed or my external vision or both. The ground that so often seemed treacherous beneath me has firmed. Although I still don't believe that humans will save the world, I've come to some new conclusions about that, about who and what needs saving and how. I thought about the times in my life where I feel most holy myself, and they've always been when I'm fully present in conversation, where I'm focused on the other person more than myself. When I listen so hard, I forget myself and experience life through their words and their feelings. Sometimes in full intentional conversation with nature, whether that means meditating in the light of the big bend moon or watching the birds flutter around my backyard feeder. In all these moments, I love everything that I see and hear and mirror in a way that feels complete. Ihidaya, whole. I see follies and frailties and I love them too. And because I love them in the other, I'm even able to love and forgive them in myself. Sometime in December, I wrote these words. If I'm part of everything, and I am, and if when I am intently present to the world, I feel wholly of and in love, I do, then maybe that love that feels so natural and true and right to me is also natural and true and right to everything, to the world, to the stars and the squirrels and the humans and the universe. And since we are all connected and I am part of it and I am loving it, it's maybe not so crazy to think that it is loving me back. I'm still living with this new feeling. I'm still learning from it. My day-to-day -day life is largely unchanged, although I am trying to be more intentionally present in each day with more or less success, but that's why they call it a practice, right? What I believe about love and truth and people and the universe hasn't really changed all that much. And yet, and yet, I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. So I've also been thinking about this in terms of covenant I had a covenant with humans, I thought, that we were all going to get our crap together and be great humanists and save the world. And even when it became clear that my covenant was with a false or at least an incomplete idol, to break it felt like a failure. It was a failure. I couldn't help but see giving up on humanism as giving up on the world. But as astute listeners have probably already caught, there's at least one problem with that. Humans are not the world. And as it turns out, there's another problem. When I made that covenant with people, with the idol of my humanism, I also chose somehow by entering that secular world to leave behind as untrue the older and deeper covenants that I had known those that are known by every child who is given even a little bit of love, security, and space to explore. The covenant with the whole world, seen and unseen, understood and mysterious. The covenant of what Mary Oliver calls our soft animal bodies, face to face with the beauty and terror of the stars, storms, and seasons, 
with magic and mystery and fear and joy with fireflies and phoenixes. No wonder I knew something was missing. No wonder we all do. I feel now as though I am re-entering that covenant, that relationship, that dance, older and becoming, I hope, a wise fool as I go, wise enough to rejoin the dance with a whole heart and foolish enough to know that I need to keep learning. This sermon title is Home and Homecoming, and I haven't gotten to say much about that, for which I'm sorry, because homecoming describes how this feels for me fundamentally. Richard Rohr reminds us that the idea of home always points us in two directions, to the past, for as he says, we all come from some kind of a home, even a bad one, that always plants the foundational seed of a possible and ideal paradise. And the idea of home also points us forward to a possible union, reunion in the hoped for or longed for future. Rohr writes, I believe the one great mystery is revealed at the beginning and forever beckons us forward toward its full realization. Some would call this homing device their soul. Some would call it the indwelling Holy Spirit. And some might call it nostalgia or dream time. All I know is that it will not be ignored. We are both driven and called forward by a kind of deep homesickness, it seems. There is an inherent and desirous dissatisfaction that both sends us and draws us forward. And it comes from our original and radical union with God. Those are his words. And now hear this. There is an inherent and desirous dissatisfaction that both sends us and draws us forward. And it comes from our original and radical union, our covenant with love, with reality, with nature, with mystery. Suffice it to say, You'll be hearing more about these ideas in weeks to come. I'll finish by saying this. Like all belief systems, the proof is in the pudding, and also, ye shall know the tree by its fruits. So if I act more intentionally during my days, if I spend time practicing presence, will the days be better? I think they will. So far, so good. What I can tell you for sure is that these thoughts, these ideas, this religious, spiritual, soulful experience of loving the universe and being loved in return. It sometimes fills me with terrified, bubbling joy, especially at the very beginning of this journey, but sometimes still now, if I think about it too intently, when I'm deeply present to it, it makes me cry. Why does it make you cry, my therapist asked. It feels good, I said, like hope. The later I sent him a message that said this, and this is also true. I think one reason finding my faith again makes me cry is the great sense of relief I feel. It's like a sudden healing, like a knife was removed and I instantaneously recovered, or like someone has pulled a rag from my throat and I can breathe again. If I think about it, those are the metaphors that come to mind. That's how big the emotions are. That's how much more deeply all right I feel just now. When I cry, I'm crying with gratitude for the lightness and the relief. I went without real hope for so long. And the death of that hope was so painful that in a very real way for now, at least, it doesn't matter if this new feeling of love and comfort and hope is an illusion, a self-soothing response to random overwhelmed neurons and hormones screaming wonder at nature and love at people. It doesn't matter at all because if I act as if and feel better and I love harder and I'm more patient and I bring patience and kindness intention and compassion to my days? How can that be bad? I want to plant this tree and taste its fruits. It feels like a little miracle growing in my heart.
So be it. Amen.